This week on the Net Cafe, former San Francisco 49ers quarterback Steve Young heads up a new internet company with a totally new approach to search. Do you have a great idea for a new product like this waterproof celebrity poster? There's a website that will pay you for it. He's 27 and he runs one of the hottest new internet companies, Google.com. Meet Sergey Brin and find out why Google's so good. Confused by all the political rhetoric, you can get answers to your questions about politics and candidates on Voter.com. And after you see this site, you may want to tangle with an octopus, a new way to assemble personalized views of related websites. Five innovative new web businesses this week on the Net Cafe. Net Cafe is made possible by RonDiamond.com, the oldies site on the internet. Music and memories from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, not just another jukebox. Additional support comes from the law offices of Ivan Hoffman, lawyering with integrity for internet law, copyright, trademark, and other intellectual property law. And by TechWeb for up-to-the-minute technology news. Hi, and welcome to the Net Cafe. We're in a new place this week, as you can see. We're hanging out in one of the cool new cyber hangouts in San Francisco. It's called Metreon. It's a huge place. We're in just one small part of it here called Microsoft SF. Lots of cool high-tech things to play with, free internet access terminals, and lots of good stuff to buy. Of course, the internet has become the great marketplace for buying and selling products and services. But what about ideas? Let's say you've got a great idea for a new product or a business, and you don't know what to do with it. Well, there is now a website for you. It is called ideadollar.com, and Andrew is talking with the company's CEO. So, Mark, give me the, the concept behind Idea Dollar. Ideas for a dollar. Uh, not quite. Uh, what we actually give people is 15% of our gross earnings in selling ideas to big companies who are also sending them out to products. Okay, so you, but you're collecting these ideas via the web. Correct. Okay, so how do you go about getting people to submit ideas, and, and how do you determine what's good and what's not? Well, we actually give people an initial uh, payment of up to $100 for putting in the idea, so there's an immediate financial incentive as well as the upside. Mm -hmm. um, most people have ideas and they've done nothing with their ideas. And for the first time, there's an opportunity for them to make some real dollars out of their ideas or just to actually describe their ideas for uh, benefiting mankind or just crazy fun ideas they've always had. And I, you're going to show us the ones that are benefiting Absolutely. mankind. Absolutely. Okay, so, so someone has an idea, they, maybe they've played around with it for a while, they go to your site, mm -hmm. they submit it, how do you determine how much they gonna, they're going to get for it, and then and how do you guys decide, hey, this is really something good, or this is mm -hmm. something we shouldn't even look at? Hey, we get about 100 ideas a day on average. Mm -hmm. um, so we have an artificial intelligence system called Autoscore, which helps us go through all of the ideas, looking at a number of different measures to work out, is an idea likely to be good or is it likely to be bad? Mm. That determines how many people will look at this idea, because people can find out whether an idea is good or not, using some search methods and everything else mm. that a computer can't tell. Mm. Okay, so you've got first a, a piece of software that actually runs through the idea. Is that sort of looking at keywords and things like that? or A whole bunch of metrics. Really? It's, it's sophisticated, geeky stuff. Okay, great. And then as a group, you would comb through those ideas? Correct. We have um, internal people that look at the ideas, and we have about 100 external people, ranging from NASA scientists to um, physicists, mechanical engineers, who are also looking at ideas as associate assessors to help mm. us out. Now, why is this attractive? to an inventor who says, hey, I have an idea, I can maybe go do it myself. Normally, if you're an inventor, the inventor pays to get their ideas to market. Mm -hmm. uh, it costs about $2,500 to file for a patent. Mm -hmm. um, it can cost thousands of dollars to build a prototype, um, to build a marketing plan, right. get a license agreement. About 95% of patents never earn any money anyway. Okay, and, and so, so you guys take care of all that? Exactly. We turn the whole model on its head. And Instead of it costing the inventors money, we pay them money initially to get started, and then we actually bear all the cost of development, and we take the products through to licensing. Okay, and I understand you also have a corporate uh, uh, side to what you're doing in terms of helping uh, companies figure out product direction and things like that. How does that work? That's right. We have two offerings that we're, we're developing right now. One is a think tank, mm -hmm. so that big companies looking to solve major problems can use our experts to brainstorm around those problems. The other thing gets around the big legal liability problem, which is why very few websites ask any of their visitors for, um, for suggestions. Okay. So, so it's so called Codename B3, and you can put a, an idea button on a company website. We handle the legal liability issues. So you're the third party that collects exactly. the ideas. Okay, let's take a look at, uh, at some of the, the more interesting ideas. I know you've brought some things for us here. We've got a, 
a Britney Spears here. I know you didn't invent Britney Spears, but tell us about this this poster. This is called the shower poster. It was okay. invented from a guy in Melbourne, Australia, and this is a waterproof laminated poster with suction cups on the back that okay. sticks into your shower stall. This is geared towards teenagers, I'm assuming, it Britney Spears. It could also be a waterfall, but yeah, pretty much. Right. It, I okay. mean, it could be other people than Britney True. Spears. Okay, what else you got? Uh, we have here what's called a glow glass. Okay. So it's a, an illuminated glass. You can ah. see that looks sort of kind of nice. So if you had a mixed drink, you exactly. see the light. Exactly, it just lights up. Okay. That's kind of fun. You had a few of those, you wouldn't even notice. Exactly. Okay. Fun with martinis. We right. have uh, this rather interesting device. Uh, this is the back razor. Ah, so I can just <laughs> shave my back. Okay. It's sounds, also sounds for uh, longer legged women who right. don't want to bend down. Right, makes sense. What else? Uh, we have uh, here is a doorknob notes. Ah. Okay. So, so if you want to leave a note to your friend your or your roommate, door, don't exactly. come in. Don't, don't okay, come in. Great. Exactly. Thank you. And uh, we have here um, a rather interesting. Um, I won't point it at you, <laughs> don't worry. You, this don't. is a silly string gun, so ah. it's actually kind of... Okay, so you can get a better aim. So you can see these aren't internet ideas. Most of our ideas are consumer product ideas. Right, right. Okay, have any of these come to market yet, or what's the time frame that you're looking at to bring your first idea to market? Right now, the Britney Spears poster is the closest to market. Really? So it's already got license deals signed, and we're taking it to manufacture right now. We have a number of ideas which are a lot bigger than this. So we have some incredible technology ideas that we bought that we're that creating new companies for right okay. now. Um, that well, great. So anybody wants to submit their idea, ideadollar.com. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. Well, in the old days when a professional athlete retired, he opened up a restaurant or maybe an auto dealership. Well, not in the year 2000 and not if you're Steve Young. Steve Young last year was quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. This year, he is chairman of the board of an internet startup called found.com. And here's Steve and your partner, I guess you're the CEO of the company, Yes, Rich Lawson. Steve, let me ask you, every time I talk to a high-tech CEO, sooner or later they tell me about the lessons they learn in college ball, you know, playing on a, in our high school ball or somewhere, and the teamwork, and the getting up when you're down, and the leadership. Are you able to actually apply skills as a quarterback to run in an internet company? Well, let's face it, all the great metaphors in life happen on the football field. I mean, <laughs> we fumble the ball, we drop the ball, we trip, we, you know, we actually have that happen to us. And so it, football is the greatest arena for inter, you know, personal interaction. I mean, if it was the greatest laboratory, if you pay attention as a quarterback, I can learn every lesson about leadership, every lesson about interpersonal relationships, I mean, right there on the field. So I can take it one-to-one -one in the business, and I can start telling them stories about, okay, this is the problem, this is how we handle it on the field, and be like, well, that works. Let's do it that way. So I think, you know, forget Steve Covey, forget all these other guys telling you about how to, you know, work together. Yeah. Take the QB is better than an take NBA. Take a football huh? player, absolutely, not a question. You talk about organizational behavior, talk to a quarterback. He'll tell you about how to score a touchdown in the fourth quarter in the Superdome when no one can hear him wants to go to the bus and go home. You can do it. tell you how to do it. Now, in the football world, I mean, you've got Sunday shows up. You've got to be ready. You've got to do it. And we were talking before in the business world, you don't see that same kind of discipline, do you? No. In fact, Rich and I, we were talking just a little, uh, today as we were trying to push the, the, uh, the company forward, is trying to get these guys, the customers, to respond to emails, to you know, dot a, you know, sign a contract, going back and forth. I mean, we need a game day in business. <laughs> we need a moment in time that we say, it's going to be done. There's going to be a score. If you're not ready, you're going to fail. Because otherwise, it just gets pushed around, paperwork's back and forth, I go crazy. <laughs> but you know what? The truth is, we would do the same thing in football, too. If we didn't have a game day, right. who knows how long we would prepare for a game. Forever. It's, like, it's like the Super Bowl for two weeks, driving ourselves crazy waiting for this <laughs> game. We're grateful for a game day. All right, so let's talk about the business. Found.com, it's a very interesting business concept. What, what's the basic idea, Steve? Well, I'll tell you what. It started, I, I carried around a loaned my PC to a friend. He gave it a prototype. Essentially, it's to allow a geographic search, specific search, around the internet. You know, the internet's a ubiquitous form where you right. can search around the world, World Wide Web. We provide a functionality that can search geographically, and that was the idea originally, and how we would use that. We were gonna go up against Snap.com and Yahoo and everyone. We were but gonna that's be a not local really what you're doing now. search engine. No, then we, <laughs> I, I got talking to our banker, Rich, here, and Rich said, you know what, there's a much better way to, to, go, to go about this, and that was to go into the offline brick and mortar try to get retailers to be able to use that geographic speci specificity right. so they can allow a search, click down, buy, purchase at the store, room, store level off the internet. So it's just another channel for using the internet as 
trying to drive traffic. And Rich, why don't you speak, I think he's much more literate than me, <laughs> in speaking to what benefits that would have for the consumers and what benefits that yeah, would have well, for... Let's understand the idea now, Rich. So this sure. is, I'm a shopper, and I'm looking for whatever, a camera or something. I can go online using the found.com technology and find out physically what store in my neighborhood has the thing I'm looking for? Absolutely. I, the, the focus that Steve and I really stood back and said, what we need to provide is the notion of a, uh, an infrastructure provider tool that allows each and every retailer at their own e-commerce site to bring multi-channel retail to a reality, and that is on that camera store site. They would actually be able to, at Sony.com, uh -huh. allow a consumer to go to that website and see if that product was available in the Metreon here on Mission Street. Got That's it. the fundamental difference. We don't have. So instead of making account. 25 phone calls or driving around the whole place, I basically get into their inventory using the web at, on their own website. Yes, and they can control it. Right, exactly. So the consumer benefit is now they can actually find it at Sony.com. Yeah. They could find it for media gratification and go pick it up, or over time be able to find same-day messenger service. Sure, sure. So That's it's cool. very exciting. And the benefit to the business, Steve. Well, I think you can also squeeze down inventory turns. In other words, if they can see what online they have an inventory, which is real time, they can now try to squish down where is what we have and how is it selling. We'll know if uh, 30 people look for Levi's today and we sold out of them, you know, today, you know, yesterday. Right. We can now tell the, the 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 business owner, the retailer, how how many people are really looking and for you Levi's today. You can predict the demand better. You can predict the demand, and you push it all yeah. the way back, squeeze inventory turns back to the manufacturer. And he can find out real time, oh my gosh, they're out right. of Levi's, let's get some into the store. Steve, you're obviously, you know, everybody knows you, you're a great pitchman, you're a smart guy, et cetera, and, and you know, everybody I'm sure came to you pitching millions of business ideas, and you're, you're running found.com. What was it about this that really got you excited? Well, it was technology that I had a handle on from the beginning. It was something that... It was sort of your baby in a way, really. Right, in a sense, this is... Uh, so you're, not, you're not the guy who just put in the money. Right, I was, well, I wasn't the technologist, though, I'll tell you that now. <laughs> I, the bits and bytes, I don't know. But I was around it, knew what, it was, what its capability was from a founding standpoint. Then now how do we go push the business forward? And then as we've morphed three or four times, what you have to do today, how do we find that niche, yeah, that yeah. revenue model that really works? And this is the one that we think is a paradigm shift for retailers so that we can add functionality to the Internet, truly yeah. what the Internet's all about. What is it yeah, all about yeah. to add functionality for the end consumer? And so in the end, this is uh, where we've come, and I have to give Rich a lot of credit for yeah. it because he's the one that saw the true revenue model that could help this company go forward. But I really feel like it's unprecedented. I don't know too many guys that get started a company. I mean, I'm crossing my fingers every day. I think we can do it. I think we All can right. do it because it's from the beginning. And, and it's your question. Com. Absolutely. Yeah. Your question, too, is four people, and now it's well over 100. Great. Steve's been there all the way through the process. Right. It's been exciting. Hey, guys, it's been great. Thank you very much. One of the promises of the Internet is that it would provide a level playing field so that people could get equal access to good information. Well, probably nowhere is good information more important than in the area of politics. You can't be a very good voter unless you have good information. Well, there's a new site whose purpose is to give you good political information. It's called Voter.com. And one of the people behind it is Doug Boxer. He's the son of California Senator Barbara Boxer. Our producer, Sarah O'Brien, is talking with him. Doug, between you and me and whoever's watching, uh, what's the biggest perk to being a senator's son? <laughs> um, basically, you, getting, you get exposed to the process. And for me, I'm kind of a political junkie. You know, our, our nights around the, the dinner table are really focused on issues and talking about politics. And being able to go back to Washington and sort of firsthand see what's going on, that I think for me has been the biggest perk. So that kind of helps explain your interest in working with Voter.com. Absolutely. I mean, I've been I've been involved uh, in the political process since I was, you know, old enough to walk. My mom pushed me in the Vietnam War protests, um, and it's fun to come full circle now into the new media and to see how the tools that the internet has brought uh, to the fore can be used for political campaigning. Now, on Voter.com, I mean, I'm a bit of a political junkie myself, but it's almost overwhelming. It's very, a ton of news and information. It's definitely the place that we want you to go. Uh, we kind of want to be the place of record for, for, for politics um, on the Internet, and it pretty much allows you to personalize it down to your zip code or get as much information as you want about politics across the country. Well, give me more examples about what I will find on the home page. Well, you can get updated on all the latest polling data that we have about the presidential race. Um, we can give you information, biographical information about candidates all the way down to the state legislature. If you're really focused on issues as opposed to politicians, you can go ahead and type in the environment and you can learn everything from, you know, the Clean Water Act to endangered species and anything like that. 
Now tell me, is your uh, site nonpartisan? I mean, I know that your uh, mother is a Democrat. Right. You might be. <laughs> Uh, I am a Democrat. Um, we have both Democrats and Republicans that work for the firm. Uh, we are nonpartisan, so we'll work with we'll work with work, work with all political parties. Um, you know, Green Party, the Reform Party, Libertarian Party, the Democrats, the Republicans. Um, it's sort of split out. We have news and information on the one hand, and there's a firewall between them and the political people who deal with all the candidates' mm -hmm. campaigns. Now, speaking of the candidates, I saw this part that said newvoter.com clients, and when you click on one of those, it looks like at the bottom it says paid political advertisement. Tell me about that. Well, in the federal election law, um, corporations can't make contributions to, to candidates. So we viewed giving space on our website to a political candidate who is running for federal office as a prohibited activity. Therefore, we're, we're charging politicians to be listed on the site. Um, they benefit because they have traffic coming to their portion of Voter.com, which they can link directly into their official campaign websites. Or you can even make contributions on the site or volunteer on the site for a particular campaign. Mm -hmm. Now, is that how you make money in order to pay all these impressive lists of journalists that are part of this? <laughs> uh, that's one way. Uh, we have general advertising revenue as a portal. We have you know millions and millions of page views per month, and that can generate some advertising revenue as well. Do you think you can get Carl Bernstein to ever say who Deep Throat is? I don't think so. I think that's pretty highly protected information. <laughs> All right. Well, if we can't do that, what information you know will he, that kind of person, provide? Out, you have opinions. Absolutely. We've got uh, an all-star cast of political commentators and reporters. Um, you know, we aggregate information. You know, Carl Bernstein is there to lead that effort. Obviously, a well-known name and someone that people can really trust. And I think the most important thing with regard to political information that you get from any website is that it be accurate uh, and that you can trust that information. And I think that's probably one of the, the greatest assets of, of Voter.com is this is real information that you can count on and rely on. Now, there was a lot of uh, coverage of the idea of the internet being the place to go during the conventions. And then afterwards, it's like, well, maybe not as many people went as everyone expected. What do you think? Well, I think that it's sort of, you know, it's mixed, it's mixed news. We at Voter.com saw a huge spike in our numbers during both conventions. Um, it's still not a huge mass audience that, that you'd like to have. But then again, television still rules the day. We are a new medium here. The internet's only been around for a few years. It's going to take some time for people to really engage through the internet. Um, I think we'll also see that numbers for all these sites will go up in this critical seven-week period. After all, as most political people will tell you, Labor Day to Election Day is when the American public finally focuses on, on the race. And that's what we're going to find as well, I think. Okay, very good. Thanks okay. a lot, Doug. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. With more than a billion web pages out there, millions of websites out there on the internet, it's no wonder the most common activity on the web is still searching, trying to find the information you're looking for. There really hadn't been very much new in the search engine field for years until something called Google came along. If you live here in the Silicon Valley, everybody knows about Google, but elsewhere around the country, some people have never heard of it. So we're going to talk to the man right now, Sergey Brin, who is one of the co-founders and the president of Google. And this is, I guess, the typical Silicon Valley startup story in your dorm at Stanford is how this all happened, is that right? <laughs> I guess that's true. We didn't really plan it that way. Uh, but uh, my co-founder, Larry Page, and myself, Sergey, uh, we worked on Google during our PhD graduate work at Stanford in the computer science department. And uh, we initially started just looking at what can you do with web data. Uh -huh. But we quickly found that we could use data mining to create a much more powerful search engine than the ones that existed at the time. And we continued to work on it until eventually it outgrew a research project, and we started out as a company. Right. Now, let me, I know it's a difficult thing to explain, but I mean, for people who have used Google, I mean, it clearly does something better than we've ever seen before. Can you explain in, in simple terms why this seems to work so well? Um, sure. A traditional search engine will take uh, your search terms and say, oh, what pages have those search terms right. on them? Maybe, you know, how many times they occur and things like that. Google goes way beyond that. Google will say, what do other web pages say about this page? Uh -huh. You know, what do the other web pages say about this page in terms of how well it explains this concept? Uh, and so it's more, just not a keyword search. That's right. It goes well beyond keywords. Uh, it'll also look at, you know, things in hypertext like headings and things right. like that. And, of course, the links. The links are very important as well. 
So taking all this added information makes Google come up with much uh, more relevant search results than the traditional search engines. Now, the amazing thing to me, though, is not how only how good it is, but how fast it is. I mean, you guys even clock it. I mean, I did a search a couple days ago, complicated thing, three hundredths of a second, and a thing popped up. I mean, it seems inconceivable you can do all that that quickly. What? Well, um, there are a couple of reasons. <laughs> uh, one is that we care, and we actually measure these things very accurately, so we work very hard. And the second reason is that we have 6,000 computers working on your query. We're one of the largest installations of uh, largest clusters of computers in the uh -huh. world. Um, and having all of those computers work for you means that we can do these things quickly over a huge data set. Yeah. It seems to me there's a fundamental problem in search when people started create designing sites to be searched, right? So you sort of snuck in words and you did white text and things like that just so you'd end up high on a search list. That sort of defeated the entire purpose of the traditional search engine in the first place. How do you overcome that problem? Well, that, that's called spam in the search right. world. Uh, much later here, email spam, except this is yeah. search spam. And what Google does this differently, we don't try to say, oh, these are spammers, we're going to blacklist them. Instead, that our ranking techniques are very well principled, and we craft them in such a way that you can't just you know, arbitrarily manipulate, add words to your page, and come up really high. So there's a sort of evaluation level, so you don't just fall for any, just because the word shows up 100 times on a that's page. That's right, that's right. In fact, we even have you know, uh, mathematical proofs as to how you cannot uh. possibly manipulate your page right. for more than a certain amount. Now, people ask, what's the business here? I mean, it's a great service. It seems to be free. I don't see any ads on there. How do you turn this into money? Um, well, there are a lot of people asking this. There are two <laughs> businesses there. And one, a lot of Google users don't even realize, but Google has ads on about 15% of our searches. There are ads in blue boxes that show up. They're clearly marked as such. Uh -huh. And uh, those turn out to work very well for advertisers. We make sure they're text-based, and they're descriptive, and they're relevant to your search. So you know, you might search for uh, you know, Ford Explorer, and you'll get you know, car-related ads. Okay. search for golf balls and you'll get things All right, so you balls. are selling ads that's and it will right. show up on the search results page that's right but they're clearly differentiated from the search results right at the same time though they're very targeted okay now, oh, go ahead yeah and our advertisers really like the performance because people actually use those ads they sure. like them they yeah. buy the products okay one last quick question now Yahoo's now gone to Google have they given up completely this sort of people search approach and just gone to the, the automated system you guys do uh, well no, that's certainly <laughs> not the case. So you're touching on our second business, yes. which is licensing. Right. We license our search to Yahoo, Netscape, um, and close to 100 other companies in 20 different countries. And uh, no, Yahoo still uses their directory. They search okay. that. Now, if they don't find enough results or enough relevant then enough they results, back up to you. then they go to okay, Google. Got it. That's All right, that's right. Google.com. Thank you. Thanks. It may be hard to believe, but we are, in fact, in the very early stages of the Internet. I'm sure just a few years from now, people will look back at the web of the year 2000 and say how primitive that was. In fact, one of the new concepts in the web is a new kind of interface which packages websites so that you have lots of relevant information in one place without having to surf from site to site to site. One of the innovators in this new idea is a company called Octopus.com, and Andrew is talking with that company's CEO. Steven, you're with Octopus.com, and I think by now people are, are familiar with personalization. There's been sort of a lot of promises and sites like My Yahoo that do personalization. You guys think you've sort of won up that. Uh, give me an idea of what you're doing with, I would maybe call it advanced personalization. Uh, sure. You know, actually, you would, if, you, if you live in the wrong zip codes, you might think that My Yahoo is more prevalent than it really is, but it turns out that not very many people actually do personalize their experience. Okay. It's actually shown that to be a very good experience, people stick around a lot longer, they get what they're looking for, mm -hmm. but there tends to be a lot of work to do that, and right. so most, most people just don't want to stick around and, and go through the effort and spend five or ten minutes, which is a long time on to the web, do it. to actually do it. So, so give me an idea of, of what a personalized experience is like at Octopus. So uh, what Octopus does, is you have to think of it as kind of a, of a, a rich graphical shortcut to content that is basically relevant to you. Mm -hmm. And the way we do it is we look at the web not as a uh, series of web pages, because what's, what's hard about the web today is you have to kind of navigate one page at a time. and uh, you know, by the time you get to 20 or 30 pages, maybe you've gotten the things you're looking for. Instead, we look at the web as a set of clips, or almost like a palette, mm -hmm. so you can pull little pieces of specific web pages 
all onto one, what we call a view. Mm -hmm. And then, then you've got this, this dynamic view of content of, of just the pieces of things you care about. And then the next time you open that view, for example, it'll populate with whatever is the freshest content. Okay, so give me so. an example. I'm a huge mountain biking fan, okay? If I wanted to create a, a personalized page, what are the types of information that I could pull out on the web uh, into this personalized page? I, that's a great example. I mean, so let's say, let's start with, you might want to go to a site that sells mountain bikes, mm -hmm. maybe one or two different sites that sells right. mountain bikes, and pull the, those pieces in onto, onto the page. Mm -hmm. There might be, uh, there's information about the, you know, several different models. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some used ones that you might want to go look for mm -hmm. on eBay. Right. And maybe there's also some that, uh, that maybe someone you know has their own personal web page that they've devoted entirely to mountain bikes, which has far more content and probably the really good information about mountain bikes that you might not find on some of the e-commerce right. sites or some of the more mainstream sites. Right. So you could literally go and pull all that information together on one mountain bike view. You could save it. In fact, if you knew about you know, 10 or 15 people that you mountain biked with or mm -hmm. that you knew were interested, right. you could actually email that view to them. And, that, and that's something you can't do with personalization on the web today. You can't share it. Right. And so the big problem is that only 5% of the users on the web actually personalize a portal or a site. Mm -hmm. Where So what does that leave the other 95% with? It leaves them with the generic experience. Right. And so our view is, so let's assume that maybe only 5% of the folks out there are savvy enough and, and want to spend the time to personalize. Why not take the work that they've done, all that investment that they've made into the web experience, and spread it across the other 95% so that they can be more passive about getting right. the experience they want, right. but it's very targeted to maybe right. their, own in, their own interests. And I was actually checking out the site uh, the other day, and I, I noticed that there is some, some interesting you know, things that people have aggregated together. If you're interested in uh, you know, some kind of basic web design or something, there's people that have done a lot of that work for you. How many people are actually uh, have actually built these uh, these sites and, and, and how are other people connecting up and finding them? Well, you know, we've had um, a couple hundred thousand users to our site. We've got two ways of creating, a, you know, you can create a view mm -hmm. and what you do is you basically use the tools that we have on the site and they take a little bit of time to learn but once you get the hang of it, they're pretty, they're pretty uh, easy to use. We've got people that have created about 50,000 views on the site mm -hmm. and uh, you actually actually go into our directory and search so through those. So you can search them and you can find things that other people... Exactly. And, and you can basically take that view for your own view, is that the yeah, idea? Yeah, you, you can save a copy of it for yourself or you can even tweak it uh, to add or delete a couple of things that may not be interesting to you and then okay. you can save that version for yourself. Okay. Now you can save it in the directory or you can just save it in your own private use and there's a lot of those as, as well. well. Okay, so real quick, what's the, what's the future of personalization on the web looking, looking <laughs> like? What are you guys going to roll out next? Well, you know, it turns out that um, people that are using this for you know maybe entertainment information or news or, or sports or stock they have a lot of the same needs that people inside of a company do mm -hmm. and so what we've found is that that as we've talked to various media companies and other corporations they've all asked us is there a way we can bring this technology inside of our company okay. and have the same effect with all so, the different so portals, data that's basically all over. corporate type portals and information it's, it's actually well. more, it's more focused because what we do is we'll actually go and pull information from things like your uh, your customer management system and your, uh, you know, your inventory system, and we'll combine all that information with stuff that comes off the web in one place, so that you don't have to, you know, constantly dig and search right. for that information. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Enjoyed it. Well, that's it for this week's program. Thanks for joining us here at the Net Cafe, and I hope we'll see you here again with us next week. NetCafe is made possible by RonDiamond.com, the oldies site on the internet. Music and memories from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, not just another jukebox. Additional support comes from the law offices of Ivan Hoffman, lawyering with integrity for internet law, copyright, trademark, and other intellectual property law. And by TechWeb for up-to-the-minute technology news. To purchase a videotape copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-310-7850. Please specify the show number and the topic.